for a venue and it's going to be three hours and he said we won't be getting done until he didn't realize that when they did it so i said well no problem uh I, i'm here i used to bring the kids so you know if you come but tonight i thought well they seem to be tired and they're they're saying you know it's dark when we get up and it's dark when we go to bed i mean when uh, uh, early in the evening i said yeah that's they like to say each time that's that's the way it is so they're feeling you know, before we had humans had clocks, they had the sun and the moon. <laughs> when the moon was out, you slept. When the sun was out, you, you worked. I mean, and we still kind of feel that way sometimes. So uh, they're a little tired. So at any rate, uh, I had something that I, I, I was looking at and thought I would uh, share with you tonight and with our audience as well. And so let's, uh, let's pray for this service and that the word touches the lives that needs to touch and we'll do the praise that you do that we pray this in jesus name amen lord we ask that you anoint your word that be a word that does uh, touch us encourage us strengthen us and uh, would uh, make us more like you and as you do that we'll give you the praise we do this in jesus name amen amen now, i'm going to try to look at something really quick i don't i don't know what the last time i did this for a long time, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it tonight because I just read it a little while ago. It's an author that I've read before. Uh, I don't want you to, well, we'll just read it and then, and then we'll talk about it. If I can find it. If not, I'll just say what he said. His name is Michael Snyder. He bet he's generally what you would call a uh, different kind of writer than I would be using at this time because he writes about uh, what he thinks about what's current events and what's going on in the world. This is what he said. And I really had known that he was a Christian. I kind of thought he was. He says, uh, I believe we are living at the very end of a timeline. I believe is, and it, he doesn't waste any time. He says, I believe Jesus is coming back soon. The Bible describes the end times, the time just before Jesus comes back, as the most chaotic in all of human history. Now, he didn't even write about Pakistan as a large nation. In 1947, when the crown jewel of the British Empire was India, split, they split into two countries. The northern part became Pakistan and Bangladesh, three countries actually, Pakistan and Bangladesh, and the subcontinent is India. India has 1.4 million people, but 1 million 400,000, 1 billion 400 million people, so is China. Pakistan probably has 200 million, Bangladesh a little more than 200 million too, so that's all. probably one out of every four people on the planet lives in the subcontinent. Pakistan is a militant Muslim nation. They also have nuclear weapons, and they're right now they're in chaotic, almost melted down from lack of food, and a whole lot of things are going on there. He didn't mention even that. So Jesus told us there has never been a time like this before. He was talking to Jesus at the time he was talking, that this time will be like this. There will never be a time like this again. Things are eventually going to get so bad that it's going to be the worst times in all of human history. He's talking about the end time, or whether it's the end time now or not, he's talking about the end time. I also believe it will be the best time for the people of God. There is no other time in human history that I would have rather lived than right now. God put you here if you are watching or listening or reading this here for a reason. God put you here with a purpose and a destiny and a job for you to do. If you understand that, you will be really excited about the future, even though things will be chaotic or out of control and wild. Jesus said the time just before his return, there would be wars and rumors of wars. A couple of years ago, I came on your program to talk to somebody else. I wrote a book and said there's going to be a war with Russia. That's what he talked about a few years ago. People said, you're crazy. There's not going to be a war with Russia. What are you talking about? At the time, nobody was listening. So he says, uh, 
I mentioned that there might be war with China between North and South Korea, between Iran and Israel, you think? Hmm. Two, two nuclear, well, one's almost nuclear problem, Israel is a nuclear problem. It's one of the worst kept secrets in the world that they are a nuclear problem. That are all boiling right now, the pot's boiling, getting ready to boil over, all at the same time. He says, then we have droughts and starvation. What is that? Famine? Pestilence? We have a pestilence, haven't we? A worldwide disease. We have famine. We have drought. Well, drought and famine go together. Pestilence is followed by famine because a lot of the young, able-bodied people, a lot of times, die off. That would be producing stuff. They die off. Hmm. He says we have this perfect storm for agricultural production to collapse. Meanwhile, we have an energy crisis. We all know about that. We're stifling our energy production to try to put off something in the future, which I'm not arguing whether it's right or wrong, but to put off something in the future, and in the meantime, prices are going up. Somebody was advertising a all-you-can-eat pasta bowl today. I can't remember who it was. It's one of the restaurants, you know, all-you-can-eat pasta. Who would that be? I don't know. Olive Garden. Olive Garden. Something like that. Thirteen fifty. Hmm. Last time it was all I could eat was eight dollars. Now I can, I'm not even eating as much, and it'll cost me thirteen fifty. Right? That's a price increase. Anyway, he goes on like this. So it, it, it's, it's, I guess it's not the point. He goes on for quite a while, so I'm not going to read because he's he doesn't know any more than you and I do about the end of times. But what he does, what I do know that he might not know, and he probably does know, and you do know. But we all know together is this. Whether the Lord comes tonight, or tomorrow, or a thousand years from now, we all have an end time. You, me, not to scare us, we probably understood that from the time we were about 12 or 13, right? That someday we're going to die. We know that. We have, a, we have an expiration date. Hmm. Whether people can argue, well, well, Pastor, you don't know when the end is. No, I don't. I don't know when my end is, and I don't know when yours is, but I do know that it will be within 100 years, probably within 50, or it's going to be a certain time. At your age, plus, uh, you know, it's going to be a certain time. And we do know that. So knowing that, what ought to, what ought to be, as Peter says, knowing that this heavens and this earth are going to dissolve away and no longer be here, what manner of living ought we to live? How should we live our life? Well, this is always true. Jesus is very clear. You go and preach and teach this gospel to the outer ends of the earth as long as you can. You don't concern yourself when even Jesus, didn't Jesus say, it's, it's not given to me to tell you what the end is. It's the Father decides. Father decides when the end is. It's above our pay grade. He says, "Your what you have is this world. Your time in it, and to make a difference." And like he said, we should be happy. He says, "The people of God should be happy that everything people put their all the eggs they put in this basket of worldly dreams and hopes and stuff is not turning out." But everything they treasure in their heart and they lay that treasure up in heaven will last forever. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the woman that uh, had the issue of blood, and I hadn't really considered it too much. I, I always thought maybe she had a continuous menstrual cycle. I, mean, I wasn't sure what that issue would be, but whatever it would be, it would be still she'd be losing blood all the time and be anemic and sick. I never thought that it could be internal bleeding, but it could be internal bleeding. People bleed from, that's how you sometimes find out people have a colon cancer or something. They're, they're, bleeding, they're bleeding inside their cell. But whatever, she had this thing. And, and she was a person that was, you could, she was winnable. This is my first point, she was winnable. 
You could persuade her of something. I don't, you could, and, and she had been persuaded many times. You know how we know that? It said that she had spent all of her money. All of her money on every person that came by and says, I can heal you. Everybody that had promised her that they could fix her problem, her continuous issue of blood, she had shelled out until she had no money left. So she could believe that, she would believe enough to act on it, okay? She would place her trust in this. And finally, I don't know what age she was. She had this issue of blood for 12 years. We don't really know her age, but finally, after all this time, she's broke now, too. She can't even pay. If the next doctor did have the cure, she couldn't pay it. She's broke. But she was obviously hearing about somebody. This guy, he doesn't even ask for money. They can't hardly make him eat anything. I mean, he just, but he heals people. People that even hear about his healing, he says, go home, your daughter's, you don't have to bring her, she's already healed. Go home, he tells us to go home, she's healed. And he says, I know that if I can just get to this person and touch the hem of his garment, of his cloak, of his robe, I will be healed. And she did, she was. She was amenable to an argument. But you know there are people that are not amenable. They cannot be argued with. You cannot persuade them. You cannot change them. You cannot make them believe. You cannot even bring them to a place where they might become believable. We're still supposed to testify and bring the word to them. And the reason I know that's so is because I've seen it in my life, and I was one of those persons at one time. Could not persuade me. I had already made up my mind. I'd already made up my mind. And there's a portion of the scripture in John, chapter 8, verse 33, where Jesus is talking to the uh, people of Israel, his kinsmen. He's talking about the Father. And they said, we have a Father. Our Father is Abraham. Mm -hmm. And he'd been telling them something, and he says, well, about in that chapter, he'd been telling them about their slavery to sin. And this is we. Now, this is how you know you can't argue with these people. This is a bald, what we used to call in English, I don't know what you call it in Spanish, we call it a bald-faced lie. It's like some people lie kind of cleverly. This is just somebody, why they got the cookie crumbs on their face, I never ate the cookies. They got the Oreo on their cheek, you know, and one stuck in your earlobe. <laughs> said, well, said somebody hold you down and grind it in your face like at the birthday party? <laughs> <laughs> if not, you look like you ate the cookies. Oh, no, no, I never ate a cookie my whole life. It is a lie. And you probably know some people like that. They can't hardly open their mouth without lying to you. Nobody's even asking them to lie. You lie about everything. Pretty soon people know that's what they do. But the person, there's other type of ways of lying. And, and they say this to Jesus. How many times they would get away with this? I don't know. They said, we were never slaves. We have never been slaves to anybody. John 8, 33. We've never been slaves to anybody. Did they forget, say, 400 years that they were slaves in Egypt? Do you think a country that had been slaves for 400 years, which is almost twice as long as the United States has been a nation, would remember it? And weren't they carried off into captivity by the Babylonians and the Assyrians for decades? Not for 400 years, but 70 years in one instance. Were they not carted off? They've been slaves at least three times for hundreds of years. And they bald faced lie to Jesus and says, we have never been slaves to any man or anybody. Well, yeah, you have. 
Yeah. How do you argue with people like that? You can't even get to the art. I mean, you can't even get them to acknowledge what what is real. So how do you how do you go on? Well, Jesus, maybe some of them were listening to it. Maybe even they thought after those people said that thought, you know what? I and they and then later on became Christians. I don't know. We, the Bible doesn't tell us that. Way. We can assume that some did because there was a lot of people following, and a lot of people became Christians. So the enemy here just uses a flat out lie. Did Jesus, did, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Satan will fall face lie. That's kind of a sneaky lie. But he'll just right out lie. And he's called in scripture what? The father of lies. When he lies and says he uses his he speaks English? No. He speaks Spanish? No. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue. He speaks his first language, actually his only language. And the only time he doesn't lie, and he still uses it as a lie, he quotes scripture. With no intent of honoring the scripture, or of believing it, or actually wanting you to believe it, but to try to fool you, to try to deceive you. Put you on the path that you can know if he's speaking to you, he's lying. Because it's his native tongue, the Bible tells us. He has no other tongue. So the woman at the well was persuadable. She had been persuaded by a lot of people to give up her entire source of living over 12 years to try to be healed. So she was open to a real healer. And it makes it even more, uh, to me, more believable when somebody is offering something for nothing. They don't have an ankle. I mean, if they do, you can't see it. <laughs> it doesn't hurt you, so you're more apt to believe them. So we understand that we might, we can be either persuadable people and our lives can change, or we can be an ops. I guess the opposition of the opposite to Jesus. We can be against the Lord. And if we don't change, we're going to go to our damnation eventually. If we don't change. So in the 12th chapter of John, I think it's at verse, uh, I have to look, 9. I had never seen this before, and I was talking to uh, Julio about that a little while. I didn't say what it was I hadn't seen, but uh, the twelfth chapter, verse ten, uh, page ten forty-three, chapter nine. It says, "Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was Jesus was there, and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised." from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For the account of him giving for the and on account of him many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. Now back at the eighth chapter, we touched on a little bit before this, when the woman at the well, and even earlier, it's the fourth chapter, when the woman at the well came to the Lord, it says that many were believing her Blaming on Jesus because of her testimony, right? Now, Lazarus, is this is a little later, but Lazarus is now testifying. He's saying, uh, I was dead. Buried. And I'm alive. And he's the one who did it. And so they not only plotted to, they were plotting to kill Jesus, because many were going over to him, but it says here, this is, I knew they were plotting to kill I didn't know that they were planning to kill, I just hadn't noticed before, they were planning to kill Lazarus as well. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, when people oppose you 
and revile you and call you names and persecute you for my sake when you testify about me. When you talk to them about me. Do not find it odd or strange because if they reject me and want to kill me, they reject you as well. They will reject you as well. Why well, can't everybody just be get along and treat me nice and that would, yeah, that'd be nice, but that isn't what the scripture says always happens. And hopefully, most of us aren't going to ever be in a situation where people are plotting to kill us, but we might be in a situation where people are saying unkind things about us or whatever. Not one of the worst things that can happen to you is when you do something wrong and you get caught. That's kind of bad. But you know you did something wrong. And you feel maybe you didn't want to get caught, but you did get caught. And you know that you deserve the punishment, right? Because you did it. You know you did it. But one thing that we have a hard time really accepting, and it can take years to accept it, is when somebody accuses us, accuses us of something we didn't do. And maybe to make it worse, we actually were helping them. Mark Twain, an American humorist, said this, but I'm sure it's been said a hundred million times in the history of the world. He says, man, humans are different than dogs. He said, well, of course we're different. They bark, we don't. He says, no. He said, the dog will not bite the hand of the person who beats it. There might be exceptions, a mad dog or one that's got their own disease or but I mean generally a dog is not going to bite the hand of that of those who beat it, although a human will sometimes. The one you go out of your way to help sometimes will bite you. Just the warning. It's part of being a Christian. It's going to happen sometime. It hasn't happened yet. It will happen. Still, you minister to them. Same as anybody. Because the ministry is not yours. It's God's. You're going to be hunted down sometimes for your testimony. Because of your testimony, you're going to be persecuted sometimes because of your testimony. There's no other reason to persecute you because there's nothing you have that has the capacity to change somebody's life other than your testimony. You just say, well, I, I, that's blasphemy. Only God changes life. No. God changes life, but God uses people's testimony to change people's life. That's exactly what he says here at the woman at the well. Because of her testimony. We saw it in the Chosen, but it was in the Bible way before it was in the Chosen. Because of her testimony, many came to believe that Jesus was encouraged to stay there for a few days, I like guess three or four days, he stayed there and said, because of his teaching, many more believe. Here it says, they were plotting to kill Lazarus, uh, Jesus, but they said, well, let's kill Lazarus as well, because he, because of his testimony, he keeps telling people that Jesus brought him back from the dead, and people are joining the church. They call the church then, but it was people of the way, the Christians. He, he's joining them. We got to do something to get this thing under control because pretty soon they're going to all be with him. So make no mistake, the enemy of those who are unbelievers is not just, or those who are wrongfully believing in power, is not just the Lord, it's those who testify about the Lord. That should tell us how strong our testimony is. Now Satan is going to kind of try to convince you to not use your testimony. He's going to make you embarrassed about it. So you really shouldn't be sharing this. I'm not saying you have to share your testimony in this setting or in any public setting. But there will come a day when you're sitting with somebody that says, I could never be a Christian because I did X. Don't want to blame. If 
that's something you did and you're a Christian back in your life. That's a perfect opening if you feel led by God to say, yes, you can. I know personally that you can because that happened to me and here I am. Just one on one. It might even be a one on a thousand someday. But it starts one on one. And that testimony was given to you by God for that person. And you say later on in your life, God, you never let anybody to me. Present the gospel to, to see him saved. You never, you never give me anybody. He says, "Well, oh, yes, remember, sister, so and so, or brother." Yes. That's a guy sitting on the top of his barn, waiting for the Lord to deliver him from the flood. The guy in the rowboat comes by and he says, "I'm waiting on the Lord." And the guy in the helicopter came by and dropped a little rope thing down. He said, "I'm waiting on the Lord." And as he started to drown and the water come over his nose, he says, God, why did you leave me on the top of the barn to drown? He says, well, I sent a rowboat and a helicopter and you wouldn't get in. There's going to come a time when you flash back in your mind, that was the time when I could have said something. I could have used my testimony at that time. That was what God arranged. I didn't arrange it, God arranged it. You'll know. You'll know. And yet somehow you didn't do it once, just don't do it again. The next time it happens, don't, don't cry over spilt milk. Don't let the devil beat you up because you messed up once or twice. Say, so, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna embarrass me again. It embarrasses me more to not speak up when my Savior expects me to than it does for whatever embarrassment it might cause me. I will see. I will see. You will, if you prevail, become a soul winner. You, you won't ever save anybody, but you'll be there when they get saved. You'll be part of it. God will have you be involved in that process. You will, if you prevail, if you continue on, if you don't quit, become a soul winner. The parable of the harvest speaks about, uh, you know, there's, there's times when the fields are laid bound, they're not used. They do that sometimes, farmers do it to this day. They, maybe they grow what they call a cover crop, clover or something. Like, you can grow clover to make it into hay and sell it, but they'll grow a cover crop, and then they plow that in to the field as manure or as fertilizer to give a bigger harvest. And if you're, you can't just keep taking out the soil or you'll, you won't, your crops will get less and less every year. Eventually, unless you're a very stingy farmer, even a stingy farmer will understand, I've got to put something back in so that something can come out. God equates the harvest field that way as well. In Mark 4, I think in verse 26. He's talking about the parable of the growing seed. And this is a lot of parables of seeds here. In the fourth chapter, verse 26, he also said, Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Scatter seed, night and day, whether we're asleep or awake, whether we're worrying or not worrying, whether we're uh, consumed by grief or not, or laughing or crying, mm. the grain grows. Mm -hmm. Just like the hair on 
Samson's head started to grow again. The grain grow. God, he says, the Lord's arm is not shortened. It's not, his arm isn't shorter than it's ever been. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't even do any of that little, like, you know, kind of nod off, and then somebody turns the TV channel, and I was watching that. <laughs> you were? You, you were snoring. <laughs> well, I was snoring in time to the theme song. Okay, just turn it back to my station. Leave it on. Get me back to the cowboy. I was watching that. So, it's amazing how many people can watch TV while they're asleep and snoring, but there's a lot of them out there. In fact, if I wanted to go to sleep, that's about the best thing I can do is start watching TV sometimes. I don't want to sleep. <laughs> We call that meditation. Meditation. <laughs> the problem is I go I go to my bed and lay down and I'm wide awake. Somebody says that's because you're getting older. I've been like that for years. But I think it is getting to be more. I get up, I go to bed sometimes at eleven o'clock and I have eleven thirty. And I'll get up I'll say it's two thirty. I said, what am I up for? Then I start thinking, well, if I lay down now, I have to get back up at 5 30 or something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just stay up. Sometimes I do lay back down for a little bit. My kids, Gretchen, Kim watch them sometimes. They say, Your kids are up in the crack of dawn. I says, Tell me about it. <laughs> That's why I have to be up before they go. I don't want them to think that. I don't want them to think I'm sleeping all the time. Mm -hmm. So Mark Moore says, This crop will come. There's something that's going to cause you to lose more opportunity for ministry than almost anything else. And it's called time. You can almost put up with anything. But time will eventually, if you don't see something change, We'll start wearing you out. And it doesn't matter how big of a believer you are, it doesn't matter how much faith you have, it doesn't matter how strong you are. If the Lord, in His time, and He does, makes you wait, because it's not time yet. We say in Ecclesiastes, right, there's a time and a season everything. Cast your bread upon the water, and after a long time it will come back to you. Mm. Not short time. There's things that we pray for, and they happen right away. About three years ago, because uh, I mentioned earlier, I have so many cases now. About three years ago, I had a prayer that I made and I prayed this prayer, and I didn't fast. I didn't pray for longer than a minute. I didn't wear out my knees. I didn't get on my knees. I I was driving. I said, Lord, I was having quite a bit of success. You can have a lot of success without the Lord. <coughs> you can have quite a bit. Evil people have a lot of success. Evil people make money sometimes. It just says, without me, you can do nothing. That will last. And so I said, God, you love these people more than I do. Not that I don't care about them. I get attached to them. I care about them. Some of them are old people. They're older than I am. Some of them are my younger. And now I'm older than they are. But they tell me their stories. And I've heard it before, and I listen sometimes. They say, you ever heard about my son? I say, I know about John. He lives in Washington, D.C. You know, I, I listen. But I says, God, you love these people more than I do. Help me find a place. Since then, I cannot stop finding places for me. I didn't do that, folks. I have nothing to do with that. I didn't even put much into it. I just put. I didn't even pray very long. I only prayed to one sentence, maybe, maybe two. Maybe it had a comment. And it was nine words long. I don't know what it was. I says, "You love these people more than I do. Help me find a place for me." Because you know why? Because he loves people more than I do. Amen. God loves the people in your family more than you do. You might love them a great deal. Oh, I love my I love my family. 
I love you. But it don't matter how much I love you and how much I love my family, God loves you more. Amen. God loves me more. God loves me more than I love myself. Right? Right. God loves us more. So we need to pray maybe, God, I don't know how to help anybody, but I know you love them more than I do. Help me. Help me to find a place for them. Help me to find a place that you already found for them. Help, them. help me to help them. Maybe it doesn't take a long prayer. Maybe it just takes that prayer. And to believe it. Of course, he makes it easier to believe it when he keeps doing it. But I was talking about time. What happens when you pray? And before Don came, I was uh, pastoring for six years before I came here. We've been together before that, back in 86 years, not pastors, but workers in the church. And uh, I would go up to assemblies sometimes by myself, when we'd have assemblies at Spokane or whatever. Sometimes we had quite a, quite a crew, sure, okay? but sometimes not. And I remember praying, God sent somebody. I did. He sent people over the years. He sent over to us. He sent people over the years. He sent you. He sent different people. But sometimes you had to wait a while. And for some of those prayers, it was like 40 years. I can't tell you that I was always believing all those years. I believed. But there were times I thought, is it ever going to happen? And if it does, am I going to still be here? If it doesn't, I guess it'll be okay because somebody else will be here and they'll be, you know. But there was times when I, I got you. I know what you said. And I believe it, but boy, it's, it's, you know how old I am now? God's a young model, you know. God would probably write me I love these people. What do you think Moses said to him? How long? Have you heard the cry of my people in bondage, the bondage they claimed to not have when they were in Egypt? Have you heard and their hard work under the tax masters, making half twice as much bricks with half the straw? Try that. Have you heard? God says, Moses, I not only have heard, I'm sending you. Hmm. Yeah. I heard. Yeah. I hear the cry of my people. And I'm sending you to deliver. That's God's answer to us. Time will make cowards of everybody eventually. Unless you place your trust in the Lord. And I think that's why God makes such a big thing about walking by faith and walking by sight. He says, you are going to be hung out to dry if you walk by sight. What you see isn't always going to look like anything's happening. You have to walk by faith. What I say, I will do. And when I do, it will be the right time. And I, that's the end of the story. So, Tonight about this time thing. Leave that to God. It's in his time. But realize something I've come to realize again. Sometimes the harvest field is behind you. It's still there. Andrew came today. Tara. And Zoe. And Mason. Because Chad, the oldest, oldest, the second oldest son, passed away. Right here to help. You, she knows that for herself. She worked for his stepdad. For his mom. And after all these years, they're still looking here for some help. And there's those kids out there. Alicia Lair today uh, sent something to say hi to church. I knew her when she was a little girl. Trina Conrad. I knew her when she was a little girl. It's part of the harvest field. I'm looking around me and looking forward. I can't look forward. I'm looking around me and thinking what might be out in front of me. 
and some of it's going back to where I already was and checking on those people. I already know them. I know their moms and dads. I know their grandparents. I know their aunts and uncles. And cousins. You know what? I, I know them. I can talk to them like a cousin would talk to you. Remember Grandpa when he did so and so? Remember Pastor Ada when he did or before your guys' time in some cases? You have people that are in your family, in your past, in your that given the opportunity you might need to testify to them about the Lord. You have people that God's placing around you right now, and you have those that are coming. And that's the way it's always going to be in the harvest field. It's not what you just see right here. It's what's you what's coming and what you said, well, that was back there, and that, that girl and her mom and dad, they went something. Yeah, they did, but she didn't. Her dad's dead. Why is she saying hi in church? Maybe it's the last church she went to. Maybe she's she's involved, but I need to contact her. Find out where she's at. She has children. Unless you're posting Facebook sometimes. You know, Jesus promised them. In John 4, 34, it says, My he came back to the well. John 4, we'll end there tonight. John 4, verse 34. Now this is, I just shared about the harvest field, but this is just before this. Or just after, excuse me. Well, I, I, I've got the wrong portion, excuse me. I've got the wrong portion of scripture right now. So, uh, what I was looking for was the part where uh, you can tell you know, the kind of preached on before, the woman at the well. And as he was talking to the woman at the well, do you think that looked like a harvest field to them? To the disciples? When they came back, they said, they were really kind of, you were talking to a Samaritan. They would go out of their way, we'll say, not to go through that county. You know, it's cheap. You see, faster to go through Kid has to get to uh, King County from Yakima than it is to go. You no, know, they say, no, we're going down, we're going to go through Lewis County, <laughs> we're going to go through, we're going to go to Interstate 5, and we're going to go north through Thurston and Mason counties, and then we're going to get there because we're not going through that county over there where they are. We're not going through that area. That's how they would go out of their way to not be there. But there was a harvest field there, wasn't there? So be aware that when your harvest field comes to you, it very well might not look like a place like a harvest field. I can guarantee if you would have pulled those uh, disciples, they would have said, there's no way we would have ever thought that the ministry, the first just uh, Evangelist or the well would start in Samaria. If anybody would have told us that, in fact, they tried to convince him not to go that way. That was in the church, but it's also in the Bible. Hmm. So, you know, we don't. And even the woman brought it up. She says, You know, our people worship on the mountain, and you guys at the temple, we're, we're like cats and dogs. We're not, we're not the same. So, on a personal level, that was them together, but on a personal level, your own harvest field might never look like a harvest field. Just like it didn't look like one to them. But it was. It was. It was the first place where an evangelist went. And because of her testimony that others to Christ, it was. And I think that a great deal of the places that are going to be fruitful for us place that God wants us to be are not going to look. We're not going to look like what we would pick. Because it's a God thing. And if it isn't a God thing, it isn't going to work. Tonight, I forgot to mention this morning, I want to close in prayer and we have comments this time. Um, Cheryl's at the Living Care. She's going to be there, she said, six to eight weeks. Go rehab. Call rehab. Which just reminded me of something. 
You can be here today. I'm talking about being dead. I'm going to be here today, and this is your life. You go home at five, and you get up, and you, and you break your hip, and you're not going to be going home for two months. Well, that can't happen to me. Well, it just happened to somebody that comes to our church, and it probably could happen to one of us. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't know what tomorrow brings to us. We really don't. But we do know who holds our tomorrow. Any comments tonight before we close the prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we think of Chad and his passing and his children. And of course, uh, Diana worked with uh, his stepdad and his mother. And knows the family, the family well. Oh, yeah, and well, and he worked there. And, uh, before her time there, he worked there at uh, the realtor, same realtor office. And uh, we all had a long history with him. When Andrew went to uh, Bethel, Don and Kathy were youth pastors there all those years ago. And so, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would help them. Uh, he was only 52 years old. His kids and grandkids help them. For Cheryl and Rick, their family continued to help them. She lived uh, Kendra, Aubrey, and Rebecca got a cold or something. We would ask that you would just be healing to them as well. But for all the needs of the church, for Adrian and uh, Keisha, Gardenia, Debbie, and uh, Grace, help them so they could be back here with us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you guys don't know it. Grace and Debbie are twins, right? Gardenia's younger. Looks different too. Grace and Debbie are twins. And just so you'll know, Grace is the woman man, okay? <laughs>